Oh man, that's fun. I'm gonna I'm just gonna go back there and do it from back there. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I feel like we should have dramatic lighting for Revelation. And so how many of you were here not here last time? Ooh. Gosh, so should we not. Not, sorry. <clears throat> I was going to say, wait, that doesn't sound right. I mean, we're not here. Sorry. You see why I got the water now. Okay. Well, that's good because we'll, we'll review a bit, and then you won't, you won't miss any questions on the final. And so, hang on, i got to get my notes here because we're going to get in the gravy tonight, as they say. All right. So, before we begin, let us start our time together with a word of prayer. So let's pray together. God, we do thank you for this chance to be together tonight. We thank you, Lord, that we are able to, to do the business of this church peacefully and collectively, God, and pray that you just be with us tonight as we continue to study uh, this book of Revelation. May you make it, Lord, somewhat clear to us that we may understand more of who you are and more of who you call us to be. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. So... Yeah, here we go. Here, this is what we talked about last week to just sort of wrap up uh, where we were. We sort of introduced the book of Revelation and apocalyptic literature with um, a set of seven questions. Uh, we stuck with seven because that's kind of a big, important number uh, in the book of Revelation. So we asked, who wrote Revelation? We talked about it with a person named John. We kind of went through all the Johns we knew and decided, well, there's no real definite way to know. And by the way, we're taking a very, like, sort of what we would call historical or literal critical way of reading Revelation. So, uh, like I told some of you last week, don't look for, uh, you know, helicopters or anything like that in my... Uh, th this isn't really a bunch of interpretation. This is all what is uh, historically written there. And so, the best evidence we have is it's just a guy named John, a wandering prophet, preaching... Uh, in Asia Minor at the time, around the late uh, first century. Maybe John, uh, Zebedee, maybe not. Uh, to whom was it written? The seven churches in Asia Minor. We'll talk about them individually tonight. Uh, from where? The island of Patmos, uh, which is a penal colony. Uh, we talked about that. It's right off the shore of Asia Minor, uh, a small island where people were exiled when they were enemies of the state, when they, instead of going to prison, they were sent there. And in John's case, in John's time on Patmos, he likely didn't lose his possessions, still had a home to go to, that kind of thing. <coughs> we asked this sort of confusing question, uh, what social function was Revelation written? And it was to be read out loud uh, in a congregational setting. So when the book of Revelation came, it's a circular letter, would go to the seven churches, someone would sit down and read this out loud. Now could you imagine sitting there and having to read that out loud? and use your imagination to read it. Um, we asked when was Revelation written. We talked about the different theories for the different emperors, especially sort of the popular ideas about the Neronian persecution. Uh, but it's definitely, or most likely, written towards the latter end of the first century, first part of the second, either in the reign of Domitian or Trajan. Uh, Domitian seems to be where many, most people are leading. And then we asked why was it written. We gave three options. Um, anti-persecution literature, um, a forget the word I use, we used last week, but basically a soothing sort of literature or anti-assimilation literature. Uh, anti-persecution obviously is the idea there. They're in the midst of persecution uh, for the uh, therapeutic, that's what we said, form of uh, literature would say. They might be enduring persecution. Uh, it's coming, so they wrote this. Or anti-assimilation, which is where, we, where I settle and some other scholars do as well, to say there's no real proof, actually, historically, that Christians, there was statewide persecution of Christians under the reign of Domitian during this time. What instead was happening was there was a temptation for churches to assimilate into the Roman culture, specifically the Roman imperial cult. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we said what genre is Revelation. That's very important in understanding the book. And it's apocalyptic. We talked about what that means. Anybody remember? What's apocalypse? What's an apocalypse? An uncovering or a revelation. And we also talked about its revelation, right? You all remember that? If Chris has a pet peeve, it's don't say revelations. Okay. And so um, 
So that's where we were. Any questions? People weren't here? Okay. Oh, how'd that slide get in there? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, shucks. That actually kind of lines up with that, doesn't it? Yeah. He's a much better looking preacher than me. Okay. That's the only one, I promise. I promise. Okay. Unless I go back. Okay. Uh, no. So tonight we're going to talk uh, about uh, what's the prophet's call and the seven, call, uh, seven letters uh, to the seven churches. And so we'll be reading, actually, from uh, <clears throat> Revelation tonight. And I'm, what I may do is just ask you to read uh, kind of to yourselves in little groups uh, together. <coughs> I'm sorry. And we'll still be in chapter 1. Uh, and we'll start with verses 12 through 16. And that, that's a short enough passage, so I'll just read that aloud for us. Um, we kind of went over the introduction a little bit last week with answering those uh, questions, and we're going to start with the really sort of trippy stuff in verse 12. Then I turned, this is John writing of what he sees. Then I turned to see whose voice it was that spoke to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe with a golden sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white as white wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined as in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining with full force. Man, this is a, an image, isn't it? This is what we call a Christophany. And a Christophany, uh, while there might be might be a popular little girl's name at some point, I don't know. Uh, Christophany uh, is just a fancy way of saying a, a vision, a, a sight of Christ, a, an image of Christ. This happens um, really a lot uh, in ancient church history, and this happens to be the way that uh, Revelation is told to John. So let's kind of break down some of the uh, little symbols that John sees here in his image. So he sees... A vision of Christ. He knows it's Jesus, despite apparently having a sword hanging out of his mouth, having, you know, fire and all this other stuff going on. He knows it's Jesus. And I think that's important to understand that even, even though this is a very symbolic image, John still knows that this is Christ in the midst of these seven golden lampstands. Um, we'll talk about the, the lampstands actually represent the different churches. And so we hear long robe. This is the thing priests would wear, so this isn't just you know, a fashionable thing. Um, and golden sash is a reference to royalty. White hair, uh, this is a common imagery throughout apocalyptic literature. Daniel, you hear about the Ancient of Days with his white hair. It's a sign of divinity. It's to say this is not a normal guy. This isn't just an old guy. This is somebody who is divine. Uh, it talks about his eyes like a flame of fire, feet like burnished bronze, these sorts of things. This is an angelic appearance. So this is not a, uh, this isn't Jesus as he appears in the Gospels. This is Jesus um, in a Christoph Christophanic image. This is Jesus as there um, in the sort of obviously defined, transfigured image. A voice like the sound of mighty rushing waters is a symbol of his strength, like this is somebody who is not playing around. Um, and a two-edged sword, where else have you heard this besides I, a reference to the rod of his mouth in Isaiah 11? I hope if you paid attention last week, from Hebrews chapter 4, uh, we hear about a two-edged sword. It's very similar to that idea. It's just a it's very sharp, it's a very powerful thing. And coming forth from his mouth suggests it's a word that he's saying. And then a face like the sun, again, this heavenly radiance. Why do you think he has to say, why does he say this so many times? Why can't he just say, well, he had a long robe and he was sparkly? You going, are you raising your hand, Gene? Oh. <laughs> I was like, yes, and so uh, I see that hand, and so, were you, is it really a fly? Oh, okay, okay. Anybody have any idea why he would repeat himself? Well, yeah, I mean, you say it enough to make a point, right? You don't just say, uh, that, I mean, the Bible, one of the things that's really uh, important to understand, especially the Hebrew of the Old Testament, uh, is a very, and of course, this is the New Testament, but these are Hebrew, Hebraic people writing. Language is very economic. So you don't say very, very whatever. You just say it's red, 
You don't say it's very, very red. You don't say it's red like something. You just say it's red and you move on. And so to repeat things is to add emphasis, extreme emphasis. So John's really trying to point out this is Jesus, but this is divine Jesus. And so I want to just, uh, this is an ancient sort of imagery uh, of this Christophany. Jesus appears, a sword in his mouth. I always imagine it coming out his mouth. But here he is. He's, he's holding it in his mouth. Uh, there among the seven uh, golden lampstands, the seven stars, uh, holding a book in his hand. This is John, uh, the revelator, uh, witnessing this theophany, either in a vision in his head or as this person depicts it uh, out uh, in, in front of him there. And then this is one of my more favorite uh, modern interpretations. Um, this is from something called the Brick Testament. Anybody heard of that? Um, as a, it's actually an atheist. He took uh, all of the sort of extreme sort of violent passages of the Bible and did them in Legos to sort of call our attention uh, to some of the sort of really, you know, atrociousness and uh, seriousness of Scripture. But uh, this is the uh, Christophany and the Brick Testament. And I mean, he nailed it kind of. There's Jesus, sword coming out of his mouth, got stars in his hands, there's lampstands behind him. So this is, this is probably not, but this is the image that John sees of Jesus in these opening words. And then John gets his commission, his prophetic call from Christ, starting in verse 17. He said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now write what you have seen, what is and what is to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So Paul, excuse me, John gets this call from Jesus in this Christophany. And that's often the point of, by the way, you probably heard the word theophany. That's an appearance of God. It happens often in the Old Testament. Um, anytime there's a theophany or a Christophany, an appearance of God or of Christ, it's not just to go like, hey, look at me. There's always a call. There's always a commission, something that comes after it. And so Jesus is giving this to John, and John responds in the way you ought, right, when you see God. He falls on the ground as though he is dead. Uh, John, he's introduced to his call, right, to these seven churches, uh, and he's explained these things he's seen. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And so um, we're going to talk about what the angels of the seven churches mean in just a minute. So to kind of review uh, where these seven churches are, remember, like, Italy is over here, and, like, Judea is down here, off the screen somewhere. So this is kind of up north after Christianity is beginning to move out of Judea into the Roman Empire, west into Europe, um, and so Asia Minor, which um, I always, I didn't used to think I had to say this, but uh, after hearing somebody preach one time, I feel like you, you have to. Uh, Asia Minor is not China. It's not Asia, like we think of Asia. It, it's, it's, this is Turkey. This is modern-day Turkey right here. And so <clears throat> this is really kind of the Middle East still. And uh, so these are where the seven churches are. You see they're all kind of grouped closely together. And here's Patmos, where John is exiled. And so we're going to look at each of these churches in their turn. And what I thought uh, would be helpful for you is to actually see pictures of these churches. That way it gives you something to look at in case I bore you to death. Um, And so before we do that, I do want to talk about the format. Each of these letters within the letter of Revelation follows a certain pattern. All of them say, to the church, write this from, and then there's an expression of the name of Jesus. All of them except one are given in this introduction that we just read in chapter 1. So he says, I know this about the church. And it's followed by words either of censure, uh, that's like, say, I know you've been doing this and you better cut it out. Um, words of praise, words of warning, or some combination of the three. And all seven churches are unique in this way, uh, are unique in their combination of these things. And so they're all followed by that. And then at the end it says, let those with ears to hear listen to what the Spirit has to say to the seven churches or what the Spirit has to say to the church here. And then it's followed or sometimes preceded by a promise. 
And so it really is very formulaic, these letters that come. So we're going to take them one at a time uh, and start with Ephesus. This is a picture of modern-day Ephesus, some of the ruins uh, there. You see it's still very much a, a Roman uh, city. And so um, would you rather read it yourself, or would you rather me read it out loud? Or would somebody like to volunteer to read? We can do it Tuesday Bible study style. Would like me to read it? Okay, I'm glad somebody said something. All right, so let's read the, the words to the angel of the church at Ephesus. <clears throat> to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know, listen for the formula here. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. Clear as mud, right? Everybody know what he's talking to the church at Ephesus? Well, <clears throat> so we, we hear that formula. Did you, you hear it to the church at Ephesus from this? Now, the, what, John, or what Christ is saying to John to say to Ephesus is he's giving them some praise for enduring things, right? Remember what we talked about last week. Most likely what's going on in Asia Minor at this time is as Christians are now entering their second, maybe third generation, uh, things are beginning to kind of get a little lax, right? First generation of Christians, they saw Jesus. They knew people who saw Jesus. They were, they were excited about this. They heard firsthand accounts of what Jesus did. The second generation of Christians now begin to see the first generation die, after a promise for Christ to come back before that resurrection, Paul deals with this, we talked about in the Thessalonian letters. And now, as the second generation is sort of beginning to, to fade or beginning to age, and a third generation of Christians are coming on, now what's beginning to happen is Christianity is becoming a bit of the norm, of an option. And so, you have in the Roman Empire, the Roman empirical cult, which says you have to make an offering to the emperor. The emperor is divine. They even offered incense to the emperor at the temple in Jerusalem. And so what's happening now is Christians are saying, well, this was all fun, but now it's really becoming a part of our lives. And so they're sort of giving over some things back to the religious cult of the day. Things are starting to begin to assimilate. And so what Christ says to the church at Ephesus is, you've, you've endured this, and that's great, but you've abandoned your first love which is you've forgotten that first generation sort of zeal you had. Ephesus, by the way, is one of the oldest churches in Asia Minor. Paul was there. Uh, Timothy was there. John was likely there. If this is John Zebedee, he was probably uh, the bishop there. And so the call that comes to them is to remind them to be as zealous as they once were, to not be so open to the possibility of assimilation, of accommodating. And so in doing that, he talks about the Nicolaitans. He says, yet this is to your credit, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Anybody have any idea who the Nicolaitans are? Have you heard of them before? I think Tim LaHaye and Jerry Jenkins wrote one, of, one volume of the Left Behind series completely around just the Nicolaitans. I think they called the Antichrist Nikolai or something like that. Silliness. Um... The Nicolaitans were, were likely a group, because we don't hear about them anywhere else. Um, so they're probably not Romans. They're probably not a movement of the Roman Empire. Instead, what they probably are, are a group of Christians, led maybe by somebody named Nicholas, Nikolai, something like that, who were saying to the other sort of zealous churches in Asia Minor, hey, you don't have to be these crazy sold-out Christians. You can be a part of the empire, and you can be a part of the church. They were probably Christians who were blending and, and assimilating into the faith, synchronizing the worship of the emperor and the worship of Christ. 
And they were saying, see, it works. We're not dead yet, and it's okay. It had taken some uh, traction with some people, but was especially, especially heavy at Ephesus. And so here, uh, Christ gives this praise to them. He says, you hate the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Christians who were comfortable enough to try to assimilate uh, within the Roman Empire. And so he says, while you've also rightly rejected them, there's still a little bit of censure to go back Remember your first love, the love that you had uh, there, again, in sort of that first generation. So that's, um, <clears throat> that's the letter to the Ephesians. You remember, he me- mentions the promise. It says, to everyone who conquers, which conquer, when you hear that word in Revelation, that is, that's a code, not a code word, but that word means resist assimilation. You know what I'm saying, Randy? Mm-hmm. Right. He told us he's going to be back here in a few old while, and this hadn't happened. And that was one thing that they really were out throwing a lot of people to at that time. Right. Hey, you know, this guy, Jesus, uh, this three, is 300 years ago. This, this is our third time we've done it. He's not here. Why? Right. Is all this really, should we really be, like you said, so about Christians? Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I'm glad you, that's obviously an issue with the early church. I mean, this is what Paul's correspondence with Thessalonica is all about. Uh, early Christians saying, hang on, people are getting old and dying. Jesus said he'd come back. He's not back. Paul says, don't worry, he's coming back. So they respond, okay, so we won't do anything. But Paul has to write back and say, no, he ain't coming like right back. He should probably do something. And so, um, and so yeah, the Nicolaitans, of course, like I said, we don't have a whole lot about them. We don't know. This is all kind of scholarly speculation given the context, the internal evidence of Revelation as to what, who the Nicol- uh, Nicolaitans may have been. So if you see the first church of the Nicolaitans, you probably shouldn't go there. I'm just saying. Um, all right, so the second church is Smyrna. And this is, again, some modern uh, ruins of Smyrna, um, which is probably a better way to say That's my South Alabama way, Smyrna. It might be Smyrna, which that sounds more southern to me, Smyrna. Uh, Smyrna, Smyrna, I don't know. I'll say it till it loses all meaning. And what's that? Smyrna, okay. Um, but this, again, is another one of the churches there. So I'll read uh, the words to the church at Smyrna. Or Smyrna. I probably will use them both now. It's like pecan and pecan. If I don't think about it, I'll just say it one way. Okay. Um, and to the angel of the church at Smyrna write, These are the words of the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have affliction. Be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. All right, so you're picking up on that, that pattern that sort of um, the way that, that these letters are given. Uh, now it says to the angel of the church. I meant I was going to, I said I was going to uh, speak about this for a minute. The angels of the church. Now what do you think that means? I think it means like a guardian angel. Like every, angel, like every church has an angel flying over it. More than likely, now here's, here's another. Do you know what the word angel is in Greek? Greek scholar? All right, I'll let, I hope you, it's angelos. Do you know what that word means in Greek? No, no, that, that's me just leading you down the wrong word. No, it means, it means messenger. We translated it as angel, and uh, we get the image of modern-day angels actually from Isaiah. There's not many other places in the Bible where it talks about angels the way we look at them. And so one way to look at this is this is a, to the messenger, to the angel of the church at Smyrna, maybe the bishop. Whoever's actually going to read this letter. So don't think this is an angelic being. This is probably an actual person. Uh, and John's like, I don't know your name, but I'll call you an angel. Right? And so to the angel of the church there at Smyrna. Now, Smyrna is the only church that, John directly, that Christ directly refers to as being poor. I know your poverty, even though you are rich. And that's something that, that plays in Smyrna. Uh, They are also encouraged, he says, not to fear the suffering that comes from the synagogue of Satan. Which, by the way, like I said, I just 
these are all images from different places in case you have different tastes in, in images. I think this is a child's rendering of Revelation, a cartoon, sort of, or not cartoon, a crayon sort of picture here. Uh, what do you think the synagogue of Satan is, besides like a heavy metal death band? Or death metal band, yeah. That would be a good name. New band name, I call it. All right, synagogue of Satan. You feel free to use your imagination. I want you to interact so I can like have a chance to take a drink of water. Um, synagogue of Satan was likely these Jewish synagogues in Smyrna throughout Asia Minor who, who were sort of putting pressure on these Christian churches because they believed that the Christians were committing blasphemy. I mean, they were going around saying, Jesus, by this point, uh, Christianity's re religion is fully formed. After the year 70, with the destruction of the temple, Christianity truly begins to become its own religion. For about the first generation, it's not its own religion. It's Judaism. It's Judaism, and Christ is their ultimate Messiah, ultimate figure, and they're beginning to form what they understood. They're reading Jesus' words over. They're hearing these traditions again. And now the theology of Christianity is beginning to take shape, and Jesus is no longer just the Messiah for them. They're beginning to understand what he meant by saying he was the Son of God, that he is, in fact, God. The Trinity is beginning to form this idea and understanding of it. And so as Christians are beginning to separate more and more from Judaism, as they're beginning to become their own synagogues, their own churches, the Jewish synagogues are going, hey, wait a minute, you can't go around telling people you're Jewish anymore. You can't go around claiming that you worship the same God we do because you don't. And so they were putting pressure on some of the Christian churches in some of these areas. And in Smyrna, more than likely, here these synagogues are, being, uh, are, are threatening the Christian churches, maybe even have some political power. It was not uncommon in other cities outside of Rome and some of the outlying cities of the Roman Empire for non-Romans to have some governmental practice, some governmental power. And so this is probably uh, what's taking place here. And I'm always going to use that, uh, that modifier, by the way, probably. I'm not going to say definitely. So that's probably uh, what's happening here. And so here again, uh, in the letter, he gets, let those with ears to hear listen, and then there's the promise. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. So again, remember, conquering is not giving in, not assimilating. So then we get the third letter to Pergamum. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is, uh, again, a modern-day ruin of Pergamum. Now, one of the things I think that's really interesting about these ancient ruins is... That's at least 2,000 years old. At least. Right? I mean, we see stuff in the States, and it can't be much older if it's, you know, by us. But it can't be much older than a couple hundred years. Indian, you know, Native American things could be, little, it could be older. But this is, I mean, this looks like something that they just tore down in Jacksonville, right? And this is like 2,000 years old. That, that just amazes me sometimes. And so uh, that's why I think it's kind of cool to see. And you can actually go... I mean, I'm, I know that there are trips that go and see the seven churches and that sort of thing. But this is the third letter to Pergamum, and I'll read it there, beginning uh, in verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. By the way, I want you to listen to the different ways that Jesus refers to himself in these letters. And you'll find them all back in the uh, prophetic call. To the angel of the church of Begamum, these are the words to him who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. You are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan lives. And I have a few things against you. You have, uh, you have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice fornication. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone, and on the white stone is written a new name, that no one knows except the one who receives it. So Pergamum starts to get a little trippy, right? And the letters are starting to get a little, little more interesting. And so here, <coughs> excuse me, to Pergamum he says, you are, uh, he praises them at first for holding fast despite living 
where Satan's throne is. Any ideas what that might refer to? Well, there are three things that were there in Pergamum. One, there was an altar to Zeus. Who is Zeus? Right, he is the chief Greek god, right? Zeus is the ultimate god. He is the head of all the gods, and in Pergamum is an altar to him. There's also an ecclesi... ecclesi it's hard to say. Axliop, an Axliop cult there uh, in Pergamum. And there was a major site for the worship of the emperor. Uh, I told you, remember at the beginning, the imperial cult all over uh, the Roman Empire... But because you can't always have a, an, a, an altar in every city, there were certain sort of central locations where it was sort of enforced, where it was sure you were made sure to come and offer your incense to the emperor. And Pergamum was one of them. So if you think about it, there's an altar to Zeus, there's this other cult, and this is a, a, an, a Roman imperial cult site. This is Satan's throne to the early Christians. He said, you've persevered even though you are there in the heart of where Satan's uh, throne is. And then, uh, it's the only church, by the way, mentioned uh, to have a martyr, and that's Antipas, uh, who was martyred for his faith there uh, at Pergamum. Now, they're censured because they follow the teachings of Balaam. What do you remember about Balaam? If you read the King James Bible, you remember Balaam, right? Because Balaam and his donkey, but in the King James, it's Balaam's... You, yeah, you know what? And so, that, that's how everybody remembers Balaam, right? Well, by the time of Revelation, by the time of the first century, uh, Balaam had become a figure who had seduced Israel into following a false teaching, specifically in order to participate more uh, in pagan society. That by the time of the first century, Balaam's sort of um, legend, if you will, was understood that he had led Israel into worshiping with the Assyrians, the Babylonians, and that sort of thing. So they were connected uh, literally, I mean, link, um, in other words, through literature, with the Nicolaitans. And so and we talked about who they are. So again, it ends, let those with ears to hear, let them listen. And then the promise, which is pretty uh, sort of thorough compared to the other ones. The resurrected Christ will give those who conquer, or those who resist assimilation, two things. Hidden manna and a white stone with a new name. Now, the hidden manna, this is something that was common in Judea and in Jewish apocalyptic literature. The idea was that when Moses and the children of Israel received manna, that some was hidden. Some was hidden in heaven. Some was put in the Ark of the Covenant, you recall. And by this time, the Ark is pretty well presumed to be missing. And so there was one tradition that said, well, the Ark has gone to heaven. And that the manna within the Ark is preserved for those who persevere to the end. Another way of thinking was, well, there's some manna still reserved in heaven for those of us who persevere. And so he says you'll receive some of the hidden manna, this common Judeo-Christian apocalyptic image. And then he talks about a white stone with a new name, which is just a, a really elaborate way of saying you're going to have a heavenly name. If you persevere to the end, you'll be given a heavenly name. So that's to the church at Pergamum. Uh, the fourth church is the church at Theatira. So we we, we're rounded the corner, we're heading for home, right? This is, we're getting over it. So, uh, verse 18 uh, through 29 is where we get the letter to Theatira. And to the angel of the church in Theatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love, faith, service, and patient endurance. I know that your last works are greater than the first. But I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to practice fornication and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her fornication. Beware, I am throwing her on a bed, and those who commit adultery with her, I am throwing into great distress unless they repent of their doings. And I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am the one who stretches or searches minds and hearts, and I will give to each of you as your works deserve. But to the rest of you in Theatira who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast to what you have until I come. To everyone who conquers and continues to do my works to the end, 
I will give authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod as, they cl- as when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my Father. To the one who conquers, I will also give the morning star. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And so, you <coughs> mean, a lot's going on in Theatira. Uh, again, there's that same uh, imagery that's going on. He talks, uh, he refers to himself as the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Again, that reference back to the uh, calling from John. And then his praise is for some of them, and he has censure for the others. So he has praise for those who hold fast to their faith and exceeded in their first works. And then he has censure for those that tolerate the teaching of the one he calls that Jezebel. Who from the Old Testament? What do you know about Jezebel from the Old Testament? Right, she was a, a right. Yes, yeah, yeah, she was a not a good person. Aphrodite? Aphrodite. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, Jezebel essentially, bad person, bad woman, and became this sort of image of really everything. And, and hear me when I say this, like, because I'm not, became everything that was wrong with women, right? Jezebel became the example of what a bad woman is. And so when, when Christ is writing to the church at the Atiri, he says, You follow that Jezebel, likely a female prophet who'd been going around and, and telling them that it was okay to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Now, we've heard about this conflict before, haven't we? In 1 Corinthians, when Paul writes to the Corinthians there, he talks about how some of them are dealing with this issue. So you see where some of the issues of the New Testament overlap one another. They're dealing with this, right? They're, there's meat being sold in the marketplace that was once offered to idols. This has been totally against Jewish law. Paul comes around and says, it's okay unless it causes someone else to stumble, or if you're not okay with it, don't do it, uh, but there's really technically nothing wrong with it. But Christ, in this revelation from John to the church at Theatira, is pretty hard about it and says, you've been eating meat offered to idols. Partly because, again, remember, the point of this letter, the point of Revelation, is to, to speak out against assimilating with the culture, with the Roman Empire. And so to eat the meat offered to idols is to take a step towards assimilation. And so he speaks out against this Jezebel, against this woman who's been doing um, this sort of thing. Now, there's also, uh, you remember last week I talked about the guild system in the Roman Empire and how part of the guild system uh, was about um, worshiping, meeting in pagan temples, and participating in that. This was going on in Theatira. Uh, so if there was a carpenter's guild, an artisan's guild, whatever, then when these guilds met, like unions, when they met, they met in pagan temples and participated in the pagan rituals of those temples. So if you were a Christian and a part of this guild, John and Jesus are saying you are forbidden to take part in this because you are saying to them, my faith is not really that serious to me and I'm willing to take part in this. And this is what was happening. And so the Spirit, Christ, speaks out against this at the Atira. And so he makes the promise uh, to them of the authority over the nations. It's a common promise uh, made by Christ to the disciples, uh, made by Christ to all his followers, that you will have authority, there will be, you know, uh, that you will be the ones ruling and judging the nations. Uh, We see that a lot in apocalyptic literature in the New Testament. And then he talks about the morning star, uh, which is immortality, an allusion to the returning of Christ and a further allusion to to immortality. If you have the morning star, that means you don't have the one that sets. You're always there. And so let those with ears to hear listen. Is all this making sense now? You got it all figured out? Yeah? You want to just stop now? Okay. Let's press on. Uh, Fifth letter is to Sardis. Again, ancient ruins here of Sardis. Uh, Verses 1 through 6 of chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. 
Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. What is, at the beginning there, what was the thing you heard Christ say to the church at Sardis more than once? What was his command? What? Who said it? Somebody over here. Wake up. Yeah, it's like, speak up. Yeah, wake up. Wake up. Right. Here's what's interesting. Sardis had been known uh, not once, but twice, to have been conquered at night while the army slept. They knew this. They knew. It was their history, right? They had been like hoodwinked in their sleep. So twice this had happened. Once when the Persians conquered it in the middle of the night, and again some 200 years after that when others had come in the middle of the night and ransacked this. You fool me once, shame on you, me, right? You fool me twice, shame on me. That's it. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. I want to make sure I get that right. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so needless to say, when he says, wake up, I mean, they, they, they have to hear that, right? Wake up. They know what that means. So he's implying that they've been asleep, like the two times that they've been conquered. Now they're spiritually asleep. He says, a few of you, a few of you have remained Remain faithful, and those who remain are white, or their clothes are white, and they will walk uh, with me again. But those who conquer, those who resist, uh, he says, will receive white garments, and their names will be preserved in the book of life. So uh, that's Sardis. Now, uh, the sixth letter, Philadelphia. This is modern-day Philadelphia, not the one we know, of course. And so that's from chap- uh, verses 7 uh, through 13. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, who, sorry, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one will open. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word of patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold fast to what you have so that no one may seize your crown. If you conquer, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. You will never go out of it. I will write on you the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven, And my own new name. Let anyone who has ears to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So here's Philadelphia again. This response. Philadelphia. Have you heard what Philadelphia, what that means? What's what's Philadelphia called? See, that's because Philadelphia means brotherly. But philos is love. Adelphoi is brother. So uh, if you don't remember any Greek, that's pretty easy to remember, right? So they are uh, praised and encouraged, right? There's, there's not a lot of censure for the church at Philadelphia because they have not denied Jesus' name. He makes three uh, declarations and three promises to the church there. He says those um, of the synagogue of Satan, remember we talked about who they were, will bow at their feet. He says, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. Now it's important, I think, to note here that Jesus does not say, I'm going to pluck you out of that time. He says, I will keep you. I will guard you, protect you from that time of trial. So those who try to read in the rapture here, it's not there. Uh, In fact, if anything, Scripture says time and time again that Christians are going to be the ones. We're going to be the ones there. We're going to suffer with the world. So uh, this is protection, not exemption. This is a p- protection of the people who are going through it, not a removal of them. He says, I am coming soon. And so he, he promises an end to whatever this is. So uh, this is repeated all over. So again, he says, to those who conquer, those who don't assimilate, they'll have their names on the pillar of the temple of God. 
uh, having your name engraved on a pillar uh, in a temple especially was a way of marking recognition for outstanding achievement and service. So if you walked in the temple, you know, you might try to find, you know, a family name or something like that. Um, and he says they will be given, they will have the name of God, the city of God, and the new name of Christ uh, written on them. So um, this is what happens in Philadelphia. Now, I've tried to zip through these to get to this one because this is the most popular one, right? Laodicea. Everybody's heard about Laodicea, if you've read the book of Revelation. And I want you to pay attention to this thing here. And I don't know if, I think there's one right up here. It's hard to see in this image. So you all, you all getting it? Okay, this is modern day Laodicea. This would have been around in the first century, on into the second. Okay, let's read the words to the church at Laodicea then. Uh, starting with verse 14 and reading through the end of chapter 3. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe you and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne. Just as I myself conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne, let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. So, is Laodicea a good church? Or are they a bad church? What are they? Lukewarm, right? Just nothing. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard it said, the NRSV translates it, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Yours might say spew, that's the word for vomit. I mean, it's, he's going to just upchuck them uh, out of it. Uh, call a Buick, I think somebody says. That's what he's going to do. He is going to vomit them out of his mouth. And so he starts to, uh, by the way, this is the only letter. Now, have you been listening? Remember I told you this is going to be on the test. If you were listening, this is the only letter where when Jesus identifies himself, he does not use a moniker from the introduction and the call to John. Instead, he says, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's, or the beginning of God's creation. It's the only time that happens. Now, this is a real heavy letter, heavy on the censure. Now, it's not, not hot, it's not cold, it's lukewarm. Six miles away from Laodicea is a city called Heropolis. And in Heropolis are hot springs. And from Heropolis down through these pipes, these aqueducts, from Heropolis, which is over this hill, the water comes down to Laodicea. It comes down these pipes that probably aren't very good. And what do you think happens to that hot spring water by the time it gets to Laodicea? It's not cold. It's lukewarm. And the people don't want to drink that. It's been sitting in pipes. It's been coming from up here. Laodicea had an issue with water. They had always had an issue with water. They could hardly miss this illusion that John is making. You're not hot nor cold, but you are lukewarm. Because the water that came from Heropolis often made the inhabitants of Laodicea sick. And so they couldn't miss that. Now, the, the specific sin... That, he, that Christ calls out the church in Laodicea. What is it? We say lukewarm, but what's the actual sin? Can you, what's it in there? What does he say in there? What do they do? Verse 17, what, is, what do they do? They claim they got everything they could ever need, right? We're rich. We're not, we don't need anything. We can take care of ourselves. The truth was this actually happened. This is true. Uh, once an earthquake had rocked this part of the Roman Empire, cities all around Laodicea were leveled. 
the Empire sent a basically state-appointed disaster relief crews into the area. Every other city needed help. Laodicea met them at the gates and said, no, nah, we got it. And they sent them away. And then Laodicea went out and sent their own people into these other cities to help rebuild. What came forth from that was a sort of arrogance to say, we don't need any help. We don't need the empire's help. We don't need other people's help. And if Heropolis can't send us the water we want, we'll find it somewhere else. So their sin was arrogance. We don't need God's help. Even the church at Laodicea began to say, you know, we've got it pretty good. We don't need help. God doesn't help us. We help ourselves. And so this is what happened. They had gold. They had all these things they needed. They were rich. So now listen to what Jesus says to them, his command. In verse 18, I counsel to you, my counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich, white robes to clothe yourselves uh, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, salve to anoint your eyes. Laodicea was also known for making ointments and salve. They made a lot of money on it. So here he says, no, no, you got to buy it from me. Depend on Christ. And so that's why he says, I reprove your discipline no, and discipline those whom I love. So here, even though these, these, this church at Laodicea has become so arrogant and non-dependent on God, God still loves them, right? God doesn't say, I reject you. There's still a chance for redemption. And so that's why he says, to those who conquer, again, remembering those who assimilate, I will give to them a place with me on my throne. Let those with ears to hear listen. So those are the seven churches. So I want to sum up uh, what we've heard tonight. Um, all the churches were subject to pressure from the pagans and Jews in their culture. Remember, this is not state-appointed persecution. More than likely, what was happening were Christians, it's, it's very similar to maybe some of the pressures we have felt as Christians. I mean, they're in a pagan culture where, I mean, it's really very much the culture. You hang out at the temples, you do, like the food you eat is a part of the sacrifice you make to the pagan gods. Same in the, with the Jewish culture. We talked about the synagogue of Satan. Those who are beginning to say, you are blasphemers, you're not like us. So there's pressure coming on them from both sides. It may not be the state-appointed, heavy-handed execution and persecution of Christians, but it's still pressure from the culture. They had to deal with internal problems in each church, false teachers like that Jezebel we heard about, excuse me, and those called the Nicolaitans, others who were, uh, can call themselves Christians but were calling for accommodation and assimilation. All the churches uh, faced the seemingly inevitable problem of lethargy and apathy. They were all, I mean, church had been going on for a while. They were Christians for a while. They didn't have any sort of, sort of set rhythm of life, so it was beginning to sort of grow old a bit for them. And so <clears throat> the presence of assimilation, common to churches of all economic levels, the wealthy there at Laodicea to the poor uh, of uh, Pergamum and Smyrna. Christians were not entirely estranged from, surrounding, uh, from their surrounding culture. Uh, again, as many Christians in this part of the world are estranged from it, uh, that was not the case there. Uh, the seven letters, and this is a quote from uh, Charles Talbert, uh, whose book I use a lot for this. Um, these seven letters, he says, do not offer us a picture of churches subject to present pervasive state-sponsored persecution. There is no internal evidence of that, and there's no what we call external evidence. There's no historical evidence that the churches are experiencing state-sponsored persecution. It is rather pressure from their communities, particularly the pagans and the Jews. And so the main issue, again, is conquering or not assimilating. Now, I'll almost squeak this in in an hour. You have any other questions about what we've talked about? I know that, that covers a lot of ground in a hurry. Anybody have any questions? Any comments? Good, because I don't want you to make any. So, all right, well, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Lord, again, we thank you for a chance to come together to study Holy Scripture together. And uh, Lord, hopefully, as we study, God, we will see more of, of who you are and more of who you call us to be. And may we learn from these seven churches. God, may we hear the the praise you've given them and the, the correction that you offer them. And Lord, if we are 
failing in any way that they are, may we correct ourselves individually, congregationally. Lord, in, in ways that we are maybe praised by you, may we be encouraged in that and continue in that faithfulness. So, Lord, go with us tonight as we leave this place, as we go into our, our regular routines of the week. And God, help us to not, uh, Lord, look at our faith in, in just a, a thing that happens one day a week. May it permeate our lives. May it be who we are each and every day. Go with us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.